A wonderful Easter greeting to all who have joined us this morning. Welcome to a celebration of life and hope. We're now going through an unsettling time of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty. We're somewhat isolated from each other, and some of us are not sure of the support that we have and what lies ahead. But this morning, we ask you to raise your voices in song and thanksgiving for the blessings the Lord has given us, the blessings He intends to give us, and the blessings He has given us in the past. Let's come together as a supporting community to lift our praise to God, who never fails to protect and comfort, as He tells us in Psalm 91. You shall not be afraid by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. So now we have a friend and a fellow plantation resident, Mr. Phil Dowdy, with an Easter message of faith, hope, and blessing. Good morning, happy Resurrection Day. We're so thankful that you took the time to join us today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to take a moment and join us in this song today that we will be singing together, Amazing Grace. Chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. 
Read along with us if you will. Testament, Lamentations 3, 22 to 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Thank you. So much for the reading, Marty. We appreciate it. We live in a day and age that people all over the world, we have never been in this condition before, at least in my generation, where we're being quarantined from countries to cities, and people are wondering what's going on. Obviously, we're all familiar with the COVID-19 virus, but more importantly, I believe is that this is an opportunity we can use for families to come together, for families to sit around the dinner table, for families to come and, and enjoy each other's company, parents to children and children to parents. And today I want to share with you a story as we go into scripture that is the most powerful story in history. This story is why we're here today. And if you'll go with me into the book of Matthew, Chapter 27, you will find that it's a story of Jesus and how he was betrayed. Jesus had 12 disciples. He picked them up from fishermen to various occupations and they followed him for over three years. But he knew his time was coming to leave this earth and join his Father in heaven. And he kept saying, I must leave this earth, but the temple will be rebuilt in three days. Well, what did he mean? So in chapter 27, we find that he had just had communion, the last supper with his disciples. And he makes this statement. And the statement he makes is one chapter before in chapter 26. And he tells them, he said, Truly I say to, to you that this very night before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He's talking to Peter. Peter said, I would never do that. And the disciples, they all said the same thing. Well, that night he was betrayed. And he went through the betrayal, was taken up before the high priest Caiaphas. And they falsely accused him. Judas was given 30 shekels of silver. In chapter 27, he shows his remorse and throws the money into the sanctuary because he realized what he had done. However, Jesus still called him friend. It's amazing to me is everyone that's watching today has been betrayed at one point in their life. Do we call that betrayer friend today? Jesus has this amazing opportunity of showing what love is all about. And the love that he gives and the love that he demonstrates is beyond any human recognition. So he's taken, and he's taken before Caiaphas, they take him before Pilate, and he is subject to be crucified. Listen, if you will, to this song, Lift High the Cross, as Travis sings. Join him. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Come, Christians, follow where the Master trod our King victorious, Christ. 
Christ, the Son of God, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Thank you so much for the song. There's a scripture that is given in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Listen to this scripture because it is so powerful. If we'll abide by it and take it in, it's amazing what Jesus will do for us. Trish is going to read for us now. Second Timothy 1, 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. So Jesus, thank you so much, Chris. Jesus is taken now before the Sanhedrins, he's taken into the courts, he's sentenced to crucify by the crowd, and we know that in this passage here, that uh, Pilate washes his hands and wants nothing to do with him. But on that particular day, they were allowed to free one of the two prisoners, and it was Barabbas and Jesus. The crowd kept shouting, crucify Jesus, let Barabbas free. Barabbas was a murderer, by the way. So, Jesus was sentenced to be crucified. Now, Roman crucifixion is the most unbearable type of crucifixion you can ever imagine. If you want to take time and study it out, it is so brutal. They received 40 stripes minus one, which 39 stripes were born. That's just before death. So, Jesus was flogged. He was beaten. He was bruised. Isaiah speaks about this in the Old Testament. What happens is he takes the 39 stripes on his back for you and for me. Because there are 39, they discovered 39 different types of diseases, infirmities, and he bore stripes on his back so you and I don't have to bear that today. And we'll see why. He chose to do what his father wanted him to do. Could he have called angels and, and called? Yes, but he said, no, it's not my will, but my Father's will. And Jesus only did what his Father told him to do. The people were mocking him. They were telling him, oh, if you are the Son of God, then come down off that cross. But there's a reason why he went on that cross. There's a reason why he gave himself so that you and I could have everlasting life. I want you to listen now to this song that's said. It's called, How Great Thou Art. Join in with us as Travis leads us. Thank you. Then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. My soul, my soul. 
Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he's on the cross, which is called Galgatha, which means the place of the skull. And they're mocking him, they're making fun of him. It's amazing what Jesus does. In the middle of this, he turns to John the Beloved and tells him to take care of his father. In the midst of everything going on, he still cares about people. You know, Jesus made a statement. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I don't care who's left you. I don't care who has betrayed you. I don't care who has caused you such pain. There's only one person in this world that will never leave you. His name is Jesus. And the reason we can talk about him, the reason we can share about him is because of what happened from the cross to the grave and then on the third day. So here he goes on the cross and the Bible says that at the noon hour, it's, he cries out. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the earth trembled and the earth shook. And I want to read this to you in scripture because this is very powerful of what happens when he cries out. The Bible says this. It says, Jesus cried out. This is verse 50 of Matthew 27. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. 
And the tombs were open. Get this. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who had died, they were raised from the dead. When he died on the cross, bodies who had already passed away or in tombs came back to life. You tell me there's not power in his name. You tell me there's not power because of who he is. Those that had already gone on came back to life. And here's what it says in Scripture. And it says, verse 53, chapter 27 of Matthew, and coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, these bodies, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurions, the guards who were with them, were keeping over guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things were happening. They got so frightened, they said, truly, this was the Son of God. This was a miracle. It shook them. How many of you have been faced with crises in your own life? Physical crises, mental crises. I can tell you a testimony personally. At the age of 17, I was confined to a wheelchair. I had rheumatoid arthritis. I spent a week in the hospitals. They did every test in the world. And when I came out of the hospital, I could barely walk because my joints were so swollen. But it's because of the power of Jesus I was healed out of a wheelchair. And I was raised step. And like, I'm, I'm 63 and I was 17 years old. And I'm telling you, because of Jesus and the blood that he spilled on Calvary, you know, they put a spear in his side and blood flowed. They couldn't find a broken bone on his body. Usually the Roman soldiers would break the legs and cause you to die quicker. They couldn't do it. He was already dead when they got there. How did he die? When the spear went in, he died of a broken heart. He took your brokenness and my brokenness so we could have life. So he goes from this Galgotha's hill. He's taken down off the cross. And he's taken into a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was a man who came along and believed in Jesus' teachings. Do we believe in his teachings? And he, this man took care of Jesus and put him in his own tomb. And then if you study scripture, you'll find out that the Sanhedrins, the religious folk, pretty much is what they were, they uh, went back to their leaders and they said, hey, we're afraid the disciples will steal his body, so we need to seal the tomb. So guess what? They were given guards to protect the tomb. So here's what happens. People are mourning. The disciples fled. Jesus said they would flee. Back in the chapter 26, sure enough, they did. But then on the third day, on the third day, it says, there was a resurrection. You see, leaders from the past that have led religious movements, guess what? Their graves are still occupied. He's the only one. His tomb is empty. And why is that so? Because he came to give you and I life and life more abundantly. I want to read for you, uh, this really touched me, and, and I, I, uh, I want to read for you what John, the book of John, you can go in the four Gospels and read the accounts. The book of John in chapter 20, verse 7 says this. And my question is, why did Jesus fold the linen cloth after his resurrection? Here's what the scripture says. The Bible takes one whole verse of this, and here's what it says. John 27, And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but it was rolled up in a place by itself. Why would Scripture even bring that out? Here's why. The Bible takes this verse. It tells us the napkin was folded and placed at his head. Here's why. Mary Magdalene came while it was still dark to the tomb, found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples to whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. I don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb just to see. Remember, Peter denied him three times. Peter, a little girl said, I've seen you with this man. He, and he denied that. But isn't it amazing? 
when he went to the cross and he says, and then he went to the grave and he resurrected. He wanted Peter to know that he was alive. Listen to this. The disciple outran Peter, got there first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Peter arrived and went inside. He noticed the linen wrappings that were laying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and laid to the side. How important is that? It's extremely important. Here's why. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, let's talk about Hebrew tradition. A folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant. And every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating his meal, and the servant wouldn't dare touch that table until the master was done. Now, if the master was finished eating, he would rise up from the table, wipe his fingers and mouth with that napkin, and toss it on the table. The servant would then know it's time to clear the table. For in those days, the wadded napkin meant, I'm done. But if the master got up from the table and folded the napkin and laid it beside his plate, the servant knew the folded napkin meant, quote, I'm not finished yet. The folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. See, Jesus came up out of the tomb with that napkin laid there and just saying, I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back to get my church. I'm coming back to get those that accept me. And Jesus said, I'm the only way to the Father is through me. I want you to listen to this song that Travis is going to sing. It's called, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. Join in with us as he leads us in song. wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus for my part in this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other font i know nothing but the blood of jesus nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus glory glory this i sing Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other font I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you so much, Travis, for reading us in this song. The message to this is that Jesus raised up out of the tomb. By the way, he went to Galilee and met with his disciples after he was resurrected. He's sitting today at the right hand of his father, making preparation for you and I. I want you to listen to this scriptures now in John 14, 1 through 7 as Kathy reads for us about what he's doing for you and me. I'd like to read for you today John 14, verses 1 through 7. Jesus said, 
Don't worry or surrender to your fear. For you've believed in God. Now trust and believe in me also. My Father's house has many dwelling places. And if it were otherwise, I would tell you plainly. Because I go to prepare a place for you to rest. And when everything is ready, I will come back and take you to myself. So that you will be where I am. And you already know the way to this place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Master, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way there? Jesus explained, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too. And from now on you will realize that you have seen him and experienced him. Thank you for reading that, Kathy. He's gone to prepare a place for you and all. He's been in my father's house for many mansions. And because of that, we can have eternal life with him when we leave this earth. You see, we are three parts. We are spirit, we're a soul, and we have a body. When you accept Jesus into your heart, your spirit gets born again. Our, what's our soul? It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then this physical body. Well, from the dust of the earth, this body came. So guess what? When we pass away, in the natural, the body goes back to earth. But your spirit on the inside is what comes to life and can go to heaven when you accept Christ. The greatest gift Jesus gave us was his life. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Guess what? We don't have to perish. We can have everlasting life. We can have communion with him. Where you're at, sitting in your yards or sitting in your homes or maybe you're in groups of 10 or less, I would encourage you to go and find you some wine, grape juice, whatever you have, and some bread. And go into the scriptures. You can go into 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can go to Matthew, where he did the last Passover, and the words of Jesus. He said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And the wine, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. It says we remember him and what he did for us. Today, as we look around and see the turmoil and chaos, uh, even as our brother Phil Wynn read earlier concerning uncertainty, my question is, do you want to know and make reservations and understand that you can't have certainty with God? What is, what is your purpose on this earth? Why did he put us here? What is our calling? Do you know your purpose? I'm here to tell you that when you ask Christ to come into your life, he will give you purpose, he'll give you meaning, and he'll give you life. If you would like to ask Jesus into your heart, see, he's risen. He's not in that tomb anymore. So he's redeemed us from the sin and curse of the law of death. You see, the Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with him, but we have to know him. So the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Christ is raised from the dead, we'll be with him. So I want to take this moment and ask you, do you know Jesus? And if you don't, maybe one time you did and you walked away and you're doing your own thing and said, you know what, I'm I'm hurting, I'm lonely, I don't have joy, I don't have peace. Today, I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you join me and just say this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I confess that you went to the cross, the grave, and you are now resurrected city with your Father in heaven. Come into my heart today, wash away all of my sins. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior to be with you for eternity. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, we want to thank you for joining us today, and I pray God blesses you with your family and your friends. Enjoy the beauty, comfort, and peace that only Jesus provides.